No power, no water and no way out for Ukrainians in Mariupol. The city is surrounded by Russian troops and for a second day a ceasefire to allow an evacuation is halted by shelling. Meanwhile, further north, the shelling continues in towns close to the capital, Kyiv. Hundreds of thousands more flee the refugee crisis, now the fastest growing since the Second World War. But here, the government admits its process just 50 applications via its visa family scheme. And in Russia, thousands of anti-war protesters are arrested as the state turns off more Western media. This is ITV News with Lucrezia Millerini. Good evening. The people of Mariupol are spending another uncomfortable night in their own beds this evening. Their city is surrounded by Russian troops and their homes have no electricity or running water. Thousands had hoped to leave today, as they hoped to yesterday. But for a second time, a ceasefire to allow them out was stopped by shelling. Further north, the Russians remain intent on capturing the capital, Kyiv. Many Ukrainians have now decided to leave. Today, the UN confirmed more than one and a half million people had left the country in search of sanctuary. From Lviv in western Ukraine, Romilly Week sent this report. <laughs> There is no safe place in war. In Irpin, just five miles from Kyiv, people are being shelled as they leave. Two children and their mother, pulling their suitcases as they ran, were killed here. After eight days of heavy bombardment, residents are trying to escape across this makeshift bridge. But this is a town where it's not safe to stay, and it's not safe to go. It's a story repeated in Mariupol. Over 400,000 people are under siege here. For a second day, they packed their bags because a humanitarian corridor was promised. For a second day, they returned to shelters when the Russians resumed firing instead. Ukrainian hopes tossed to the wind. No journey in this country is without pain. Lviv in the west is where those who do manage to escape are arriving. A confused, chaotic staging post for exhausted families, because this is the scene that greets them. The UN is calling this the fastest growing refugee crisis since the Second World War, and this is what it looks like. Thousands upon thousands of people arriving here at the train station in Lviv, cradling their children, carrying their pets and their luggage. And as far as you can see, stretching down here, more people arriving, trying to leave. Many of them with just no idea where they will go. How old are your children? Uh, three and uh, one and a half. Vitaly has managed to escape from the ruins of Kharkiv under heavy Russian shelling. You've been traveling for 22 hours? Yeah, uh, to Chernobyl. And then here we like five hours from Chernobyl to Lviv because uh, uh, trains are moving very slowly because uh, no, there were m many trains on the lines. Yeah. And how are you managing with your children? Uh, we have no choice. As we're filming, this lady wants to tell me her story. She's had to leave her son behind in Kharkiv. We barely need a translator to understand her pain. Romilly Weeks, ITV News, Lviv. Let's return to that attempt to evacuate people in Mariupol. The city is on the south coast and is a centre for industry, higher education and business. It is currently surrounded by Russian troops who have advanced from both the west and east. The plan was to evacuate them just over 100 miles northwest of Zaporizhia. Our correspondent Dan Rivers is there and sent this report from the centre where they've been expected to stay. 
Well, a couple of weeks ago, this used to be a circus in Zaporizhia. Now it is a reception center for those displaced by the fighting. The Russians are only about 40 miles down the road. You can see they've got uh, mattresses on the floor for when people arrive and they can get some sleep. So far, they've had about 250 people here who have been uh, given clothes and food and medicine and so on. But they are expecting many, many more uh, from Mariupol particularly. You can see here the people of Zaporizhia have been generously donating everything they can to help these people who've uh, been forced to leave their homes and leave everything behind in most cases by uh, the fighting. We understand that this convoy that was due to come out uh, today, it's the second attempt, has now been cancelled and I, I think they're going to try again tomorrow from Mariupol, but they are expecting thousands, probably tens of thousands of people here and in a couple of other reception centres like this. We're told that so far only three families have managed to escape from that port city, dodging the shelling as they went uh, to get out and were processed here. But this really is going to become very busy once uh, the enormous number of people escape. It's a city of 400,000 people that's been under shelling uh, for many days now. Uh, and, and here at least they will have some respite, they'll have some food, some, some clothes, medicine before they can then be taken to safety. Dan Rivers reporting there. Well, this is the situation on the ground on day 11 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. While Mariupol is the focus of concern in the south, the Russians are also targeting cities in the north, with reports tonight that rockets have been fired at a physics institute in Kharkiv, which houses a nuclear reactor. Meanwhile, the Russians have opened up a new corridor as they target the capital, Kyiv, now from the east as well as the north. Let's go to our Europe editor, James Mates, who is in the capital, Kyiv. James, how much has this war changed over the weekend? It's been changing for several days now. Uh, as the uh, Russian attempt at a, a, a blitzkrieg, a lightning victory, uh, ran into fierce opposition and their own incompetence and has more or less ground to a halt, they are now resorting, it seems, to simply using heavy artillery and missiles against uh, any city that, uh, that resists them. Uh, it's the sort of weaponry, in fact, that even a no-fly zone wouldn't help very much with. Uh, the... Um, Chief victims of this, of course, Kharkiv in the northeast, Mariupol in the south. Uh, no communications there with them. The Halo Trust, the British charity, uh, has staff trapped there. They last heard from them yesterday evening when they said no water, no electricity, no food in stores. This is a living hell. And that was uh, 24 hours ago. Uh, the extraordinary thing about this is that both these cities are predominantly Russian speaking. Uh, these are the people who, in his justification for this war, President Putin said these there are fellow Russians. They're basically the same of, as us. And yet he is doing this to them, not even uh, ordering the guns to remain silent long enough to get the civilian population out. Uh, President Macron of France is determined to keep the diplomatic route open and uh, uh, never allow the Russians to say there is no negotiated settlement possible here. He spent uh, almost two hours on the phone to President Putin again tonight. Uh, no progress whatsoever. The demands haven't changed. The whole denazification thing uh, remains in place. Uh, absolutely no sign of any change of Russian policy. All right, James in Kiev. Thank you. Well, images from Ukraine have horrified many around the world, but in Russia, thousands who protested about what's happened were apparently arrested today. Even showing pictures of what is happening is getting harder. On Friday, President Putin signed a new law banning what the country calls fake news about its military. Now a succession of broadcasters and social media companies have stopped operating in the country. Vincent McAvenny reports. <laughs> In squares across Russia this weekend, no matter your age, authorities crack down hard on protesting the Ukrainian invasion. Human rights groups say just today almost 4,000 were arrested in 53 cities. But details of a war that President Putin has banned being described as such are getting harder to find for the Russians. With independent domestic broadcasters forced off air, Putin has turned his sights on where the young get their news. On Friday, Meta-owned Facebook and Instagram were blocked in retaliation for their removal of Russian state media outlets in Europe. The BBC News website was also restricted. This morning, the BBC World News Channel was taken off air in Russia. And tonight, TikTok has announced it will be suspending services, citing concerns over their employees' safety.
Viral footage like this released by Ukraine of a Russian helicopter being shot down is what Putin wants to stop from spreading. Last week, they shut down the independent radios and independent newspapers. Social media is the last kind of frontier. And by now, he has shut down that and therefore Russians will not be able to access it. But they can still find information on Telegram and they can see what is actually going on in Ukraine on the ground. But they will have to be looking for it and it's going to be a lot harder to find it. Because of these workarounds, Moscow police were stopping young people and searching their phones today detaining them if they refused. There may be ways for Russians to beat Putin's censorship, but the risks now might be too great for some to seek the facts. Vincent McAvinney, ITV News. Broadcasters aren't the only companies leaving Russia. Tonight, American Express has announced it is suspending all its operations in Russia in response to the country's invasion of Ukraine. Amex said globally issued cards will no longer work there. They, followed, they follow Visa and MasterCard in taking similar action. Meanwhile, the United States is considering a ban on all imports of Russian oil. Our U.S. correspondent Emma Murphy is outside the White House, where protesters have gathered to demand a no-fly zone. Emma, just how much pressure is building on President Biden to meet the Ukrainians' demands for more help and support? Well, there's an awful lot of pressure growing, led, of course, by President Zelensky, who's in constant touch by satellite phone with President Biden. And then the pressure builds with those dreadful images that are coming out Visit. hour by hour from Ukraine. It's echoed by these people here and also by cross-party politicians who are really trying to press this administration to do more. And there are two big issues that they want to see more action on. The first is the import of oil and gas from from Russia. Around um, $350 million of oil is brought to the West every single day. That's money that's going into the Russian coffers and money that will be used to pay for this offensive in Ukraine. And so many politicians here and elsewhere are now calling on the United States and the West to ban those imports. And then, of course, there is this issue of the no-fly zone that does look incredibly unlikely, but they are trying to find a compromise at this stage. We understand that basically tonight there are conversations going on with Poland so that Poland can provide to Ukraine Russian-made fighter jets that the Ukrainian pilots know how to fly. In order to try and protect the Polish situation, the Americans will add in some other fighter jets that will be able to sort of replenish their supplies. That united front that we've talked about for so long is still very much in play tonight, but so is the huge pressure on them. Emma in Washington, thank you. Well, the world is now having to respond to the vast number of refugees fleeing Ukraine. More than a million of those who've left have passed into Poland. Our correspondent Rebecca Barry is in Szemyszol on the Polish border, where she met some new arrivals who sought refuge in a church. At a time like this, people talk of evil. Those that believe look to God. Most Ukrainians are Orthodox Christians, and at the Church of Our Lady of Sorrows on Poland's border with Ukraine, they were praying for them. The war hasn't crossed the border yet, the priest told his congregation, but it exists among us in the people who fled their homes. People like Vera, who left Lviv with her four children. After the service, we follow them upstairs to the church rafters and find a scene reminiscent of another European war when those fearing for their lives hid in attics. At home in Ukraine, Tonight, Vera was a desperate teacher. Journey. She thought they'd only be away for a week. I pray for Ukraine, for our soldier. Uh, for our people, uh, for our um, future, for our future. And your children's future? Yes. And each day brings more families just like them. 
More than one and a half million people have now fled Ukraine. Around a million of them have come here to Poland. It's a number hard to fathom. Each one a life, a future upended. Back in the church attic, at least Vera and her children are warm, grateful for the help, but now trapped in uncertainty. Rebecca Barry, ITV News, Przemysl, Poland. Here in the UK, the government is under pressure over the number of Ukrainian refugees who have been granted visas. The Home Office confirmed this afternoon that just 50 people have been issued visas so far, despite nearly almost 12,000 people starting applications. The Home Secretary said they were surging the number of staff in application centres. Our political correspondent Carl Dinan reports. There has been pressure on the government to accept more Ukrainian refugees and a new visa scheme was opened on Friday. Today, the Home Office said it had so far granted 50 visas. But after delivering donations to a Ukrainian centre, the Home Secretary said the scheme had only just started. The scheme opened on Friday, opened in, on Friday afternoon. I was in Poland, actually, on the border um, when we launched the scheme. Let's be clear, this is the first scheme in the world that's up and running in this short period of time. 10,000 applications and yes, grants are happening as we stand here right now. In fact, the EU has also started a scheme allowing Ukrainians in. But after their meeting, the Ukrainian ambassador said the British scheme could be made easier. We believe that some of the procedures can be really simplified. We will sort it out later. Now we have to let as, ma as maximum people we can have as possible. As of this morning, the Ukraine family visa scheme had seen nearly 12,000 applications started, 5,500 submitted, 2,000 interview appointments booked, and those 50 applications granted. So we're not complaining. But that's our dog over there. Yuri works as an electrician in Maidstone. His partner Anastasia escaped from Ukraine alone and on foot. Now they're in Calais trying to navigate the visa process. Why it was difficult? Because the website, uh, that's the, where we're supposed to upload our documents, it wasn't working. So it was just bugging from time to time. So only today, today we had finished. Has it been a difficult journey? Now, the... Yeah, very difficult. Has it been frightening? Yes. <laughs> but interviews aren't even being carried out in Calais, so now they have to go to Brussels. With as many as 200,000 applications expected, the Home Office say they are surging staff into all their visa application centres around Europe. So, Carl, the Prime Minister has spoken to President Zelensky this afternoon. What did they discuss? Well, the Prime Minister said he would try and source more defensive equipment for Ukraine and the two men spoke about the worsening humanitarian situation in the country. What we don't know is whether President Zelensky asked again for a no-fly zone. That's the one thing we know the Ukrainians want but that Britain and NATO just aren't willing at this stage to deliver. It is going to be a busy week of diplomacy here. The Canadian and Dutch prime ministers will be visiting tomorrow and then there will be four Eastern European leaders in town on Tuesday. What is the government doing about toughening sanctions against Russia? Well, they're rushing through emergency sanctions legislation in Parliament tomorrow, which will remove some of the legal constraints around sanctions. The government says it'll make, allow them to go harder and faster on sanctioning individuals. They will also require oligarchs to register what UK property they own. Now, there's a row about this. The government is reducing the time uh, oligarchs are allowed from 18 months to six months to do that. But Labour says, look, six months is still far too long. It allows them to sell up and get the money out. It should be 28 days uh, that they have to register that property. I think the government has been stung by the accusation, though, that they've been too slow on oligarchs, pointing out that the banking assets frozen here have been much greater than the EU, greater even, in fact, than the United States, although uh, critics have pointed out that that just goes to show quite how much Russian money there was sloshing about here in the first place. All right, Carl, thank you. And that is where we'll leave it this evening. But there is more analysis of the situation in Ukraine on our ITV News podcast, What You Need to Know. The latest episode, How Far Will Putin Go?, is available wherever you get your podcasts. And that is all for tonight. The weather is up next. But from all our teams here in Ukraine and around the world, good night.